Okay. Good evening. I'm Donna Schneider, president of the Prince George's County Historical Society, and I welcome you to our March 27th, 2023 history chat with Brian Calcott and John Peter Thompson. This evening, they will march into a discussion about Brian's research on the history, heritage, people, places, and culture of the town of Upper Marlboro. The chat will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, which you can access through our website, www.pghistory.org. We would appreciate it if you mute your microphone. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will get to them after the chat. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Brian. He is an amateur historian who has lived in Prince George's County his entire life. And he moved to the town of Upper Marlboro in 2010 with his wife, Patty, um, into the historic home content, which was built around 1787. He gained his love of history from his parents who made the Sunday road trips to museums, battlefields, parks, uh, et cetera, a, as a weekly event, um, rain or shine. And his mother's parents were uh, worked at um, the Mountain Farm Museum in the Great Smoky Mountains for many years as quote unquote farmers. Um, this was this park, this museum was in North Carolina. Um, since 2012, he and his wife have supported the town of Upper Marlboro's historical committee for events in the town and has been collecting and posting about the history of the, the town on the community's uh, committee's Facebook page. So welcome, Brian, and go ahead, John Peter. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Donna, and, and welcome, Brian. I As I sit here in Wells Corner overlooking the basin that is Upper Marlboro, I imagine that maybe 200 years ago when this was tobacco field, it could have seen your house from up here. We're not, we are neighbors in some sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm delighted to have this conversation about Upper Marlboro. And, and I thought, Brian, perhaps we could just start with what's an Upper Marlboro? Maybe you could give us a, a little brief overview. overview. Okay, um, so the town of Upper Marlboro, what is in it? Well, a courthouse is, and some of the county facilities are in Upper Marlboro, and there's a way that that came to be. I can go into that, but for the most part, we're about 10 miles to the east-southeast of Washington, and maybe 15 miles from Annapolis, and then south of Baltimore, 30 miles. So if you can get the fix mm -hmm. of where that is in the county, it's just to the east of the Patuxent River. It, it, Brian, maybe we will we'll follow on here. I, I like to tell John my Peter? overdrive. John Peter, yes. we've lost your video. If I dare not try to find it. You okay. may lose me if I try it. So folks, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Brian's going to handle all the visuals. I don't have any visuals, so we'll just go without the visuals of me. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian. I, I like to tell people that Upper Marlboro is older than the United States. Is that a true statement? Absolutely. It's a colonial town. In fact, it's a port town. And in fact, before that, it was really a town even before it became the courthouse town. So or the, even the port town. Um, it really, okay, so to start it all out, uh, Colonel Belt's Landing was on the western branch of the Tuxent River before the Tuxent River silt, silting occurred. It was actually navigable. Before that, it was populated by the Native Americans who did not have a good name for it because I can't find it in my research. Uh, maybe Ralph Eshelman could help there. But um, in 1706, it was declared a port town because the King of England wanted to try to get to tax on tobacco. And if you shipped it out of your personal wharf, he wasn't able to tell what you shipped and therefore not tax it. And so the king wanted his money and so designated some port towns. We're one of them. I, I might interject here and forgive me, Brian, it wasn't the king who did that, it was the queen. Um, true. This true. is Queen Anne's doing. She happened to have a husband, though, whose name was uh, John Churchill. Prince George's. Prince George, as, right. Yes, Prince George. But you're the uh, star here, so let's let's talk a little more about Upper Marlboro and some of the research that you've uh, found and 
kind of take it away. What would you like to share with us? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so Marlboro, what's in a name, right? So M-A-R-L-B-O-R-O-U-G-H. Um, right now, you know, the town of Upper Marlboro has an upper added to it and it doesn't have the U-G-H anymore. Um, John Churchill, at, as I flubbed up in the beginning of this, uh, he, he was um, the first Duke of Marlboro and he did very well in the uh, French Wars. In fact, he was a great commander. And of course, having the town named after him was, um, well, he was the reason the town was named Marlboro. Um, originally. And so really the upper came into play when there was a lower Marlboro uh, town and that was across the river, across the Tuxent River, which divides the counties. Um, and that was before 1744 when they replatted the town. So what is in the name of Upper Marlboro? Really it's the fact that we um, we have a great colonial heritage and that we started from England as a colony. And it was almost entirely about the production and shipping of tobacco. And of course the money's there up. Brian, um, this was tobacco country. And that of course means it was a slave country, right? Slavery powers tobacco. Yes. Um, did slavery pay, play a part in Upper Marlboro? Yes, it did. Um, so antebellum, which is, you know, the pre-Civil War era, Prince George's County had the largest number of slaves by county in Maryland and by a large portion. And the three districts around um, in Prince George's County, which included Marlboro, Bladensburg, and I'm trying to think of the other, held more slaves than most of the other counties, you know, did each of those. So it truly was a very tremendously labor intensive crop growing tobacco. It was hard on the land, but the land around Upper Marlboro was actually the best type of soil. It was a loamy soil and um, it was the best for growing the type of tobacco, which is considered premium tobacco. But the way they did it with first indentured servants and almost immediately thereafter, slavery um, required a tremendous amount of labor. And it's the unfortunate consequence that people would, you know, between England and even up until the Civil War would hold others for forced labor to do all this hard labor, even though some was skilled. Um, it's just a horrible part of our country's history. And of course, Marlboro is part of that. Brian, I know that, um, that you've told me a couple times, history isn't your thing, but research is. And maybe we can focus on some of the research that you do, some of the materials, how you go about doing the research, where you look, um, you know, what are the sources? What yep. kind of things are you collecting? Okay. Uh, yeah, my, my comfort spot. So you can tell I'm not truly a historian as much as I am the guy who helps the historian go out and find the various items. So what I've done for the town of Upper Marlboro is I've tended to collect artifacts or tangible history. So if you had a photograph from the 40s in your attic and you uh, passed away, your kids would pretty much throw that shoebox out and it would be gone forever. So some of the pieces of history from mid-century and even start of the 1900s would be lost or, and have been lost and very little actually ends up in the archives. So my focus has been on setting up the uh, ability to go in and collect these uh, the photographs and the memorabilia like racing trophy for Marlboro Raceway or the horse racing uh, photos and try to collect them and digitize them and catalog them um, in such a way that future generations would be able to have access to those things, at least at the highest resolutions I can scan them at in the case of the newspapers, etc. Um, but my core purpose has been like in support of various 
uh, requests of the town, which is to help find things like when there was um, a question about who was sheriff back in the day, um, back in the 1940s, I could do some research on that. Um, literally, it was anything that the town had an interest in supporting, like the architecture or a good story or something to post on Facebook as outreach. So that's sort of my my sweet spot of what I do and how I do it. Um, mostly, I do have the ability to get on eBay and, and buy things, of course, um, but Really, it's about getting to Facebook and getting to the people, having events where we can talk to the people about their various stories. So we, we've got a couple things going there. Um, actually, the College of Southern Maryland is going to be doing a tour of Trinity Church and St. Mary of the Assumptions Church um, in mid-April. Those are the sort of activities that I work with as an amateur historian and researcher. Where, when you collect these photographs, you say you're digitizing them. Do you, is there like a town museum or archive? What happens to the originals? Yep. So um, I have the originals in archive. The town has the digitals in archive. I have the digitals in archive um, in other locations. Uh, they're not truly stored in the cloud at this point, but um, I can give you a quick, quick, idea of how I can do it or how I do it. You're looking at PG Atlas here. Um, so if I want to do research on, for example, the Beggar's Opera. So there was a Beggar's Opera. Let me see if I can share this screen real quick. Okay. There we go. Let me know if you can see it. We All can right. see it. So, hmm, by permission of his honor, the president at the new theater in Upper Marlboro by the company of comedians from Annapolis on Thursday next, being the 20th of this instant August will be performed the beggar's opera, likewise a farce called the lying valet to begin precisely at seven o'clock in this from the 1752 August 13 paper. So what I could do with that is I could go do some research and I typically do, and I might find an actual copy of the Beggar's Opera, which I did. That sits in a display case at the town hall. And if you visit our town hall, it's on School Lane in, of course, Upper Marlboro, and they'll show you an actual copy of the Beggar's Opera. Brian, are you telling me that um, Upper Marlboro had opera 200 plus before there was the United States? Yes. Are we talking about the same Upper Marlboro? Yeah, isn't that funny how that comes to be? You don't think it, but at the time it was, it wasn't in Annapolis, it wasn't in Baltimore, let's not go that far, but it, it was certainly a place to be. Um, in fact, this particular opera was accompanied by uh, music, which seems to be, at least from all I can tell about the first instance I've seen of a musical accompanied opera in America. Well, That's my understanding also. Yep. Um, is the building the opera house? Was it an opera house? What do you know? What kind of building? It, 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 it was more a tobacco warehouse. I mean, come on. The whole place was just all about market and getting stuff in from the ships and selling English goods and, you know, bringing tobacco into the warehouses. So they obviously made a dual use of the warehouse. This is the story that I heard and uh, researched um, as far as I can tell. So what other goodies do you have on that magical device of yours that you might share with us? Is there any other kind of things there? Of course. So if someone says, hey, I want to know what the town looked like some years ago, you can do a quick search. People are screen sharing right now. They can see. And I can go to a directory of postcards and I can see if I have any good ones here to show you what the town looked like 110 years ago. So... Brian, you um, uh, a few years ago, when I was still mobile and could see, you led a, a walking tour of the town. Do you still do that? Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be, don't quote me on the exact date, but June 18th, you can look on the town's website and they have a constant contact to sign up for. Um, what I do is I walk downtown Main Street, which I'm displaying on the screen for those 
we're able to see that, that there is a courthouse there to the left. This is looking from the split at Pratt Street, and you can see horse-drawn carriage down there because this is a 1906 image. And these how, are the how much of Upper Marlboro today is, um, your house is 18th century. How much of 18th century Upper Marlboro still exists? Not much. So you have Darnell's Chance. You have the Crawford's house, which is Kingston. And then you have Content. And then potentially some elements incorporated into some 19th century buildings. So honestly, um, not a whole lot's left. But the 1800s stuff or the 19th century stuff is also to the west of town. There's a bit more of that. Brian, I remember something about, um, was it Mrs. O'Leary's cow and, and some fire in Chicago, which leads me to remember what, didn't Upper Marlboro have a cow start a fire or something in the 1920s? Um, Maybe it was a bakery. Yeah, bakery. So don't know so much about the cow part, but I surely can tell you if there's any town that's been defined by fire, it's Upper Marlboro. I have umpty ump instances of fire related discussions where in the late 1800s there were a series of arsons or suspected arsons. Um, in fact, the 1706 plat that when the town was founded, they actually had lots where they put houses that had chimneys made of wood and you you're just like i can't believe this but that's the way they built them back then mud and wood um and unfortunately it was so bad that when they replatted the town in 1744 they said look when you build on these lots you have 12 months to make those chimneys stone or brick and all new houses have to be stone chimneys so they fought this fire problem for as long as upper marlboros has existed unfortunately. And in the 1920s, you're referencing the 1924 fire, fire um, Bennett's lunchroom, and it was on the side just to the north of the court, or to the east of the courthouse, sorry, that whole section of town burnt down. But fortunately, we started to get our act together in the late 1800s, and in 1886 or thereabouts, a fire company was formed, and that fire company of course, uh, it originally started near where the m and Bank is, which was formerly a bank way back in the day even, and then later moved up to by Pat Pratt Street, where it still is today. But back then, they just weren't good enough. They couldn't pump the water fast enough from the pond, and they couldn't pump it up the hill from the river, and they certainly in the old days didn't have the pumps, and they used buckets, and so they just couldn't keep it together as a town. And it, it defines us to this day, John Peter. I'm sorry to go on so long. It just fires a big thing. Um, the courthouse burning down in recent era when the workmen were working on it. That is the hopefully the ending chapter of it. And I'll knock on wood because you know it's not going to be. Um, fires truly did define our town. So I have a, a Upper Marlboro has such an extensive history, and there's some other sites. There's something that uh, we call the stone building, and wasn't that kind of a first? What you know what I'm talking about? The stone building yeah, that a was telephone exchange. How about that? Yeah. Do you have any kind of tidbits for us about why it was built and what yeah, the first so... was? So in the old days, in fact, I should go back to my 1906 image. Um, I'm going to show you something downtown. Those are not electric wires, folks. Those are the telephony type of things. Um, unfortunately, as one wire goes here and one wire goes there, I'm sure it got out of control quite quickly. We weren't electrified as a town until the 20s. So to that end, if you look at this map, this is a Google Earth photo. It's not actually on here, but I'll zoom in a little. This is the Crane Highway Monument, which we recently celebrated. The um, We'll talk the, about that in a minute. Up, up there. But right here, I will zoom in a little more, is the top of a building that is iconic to the town. It's the old stone building. And it was used as a telephone switchboard operation. Um, we're 
I'm not talking old, 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 but you know, forties era stuff. Um, and after that, it was a nine one one center, and after that, it's sort of been boarded up, doing not a whole lot. Um, I hope we can find a way, you know, to reuse the building. It is such an iconic structure, especially if you're coming from Crane Highway and looking at it. It's really incredible, out of place almost for character. It's slate roofed and it's all stone surround. It really is neat. Brian, what can you tell me about, you You mentioned the Crane Highway Monument. Do you have any information for us on the first paved road outside an urban city in the United States? Oh boy, do I. I unfortunately, if you didn't get to attend the event, it was last year in October. Um, effectively started in 1922 and finished in 1927. And it was only 30 mile section of paved road from good old Upper Marlboro all the way to sort of where the um priest bridge is which is route 450 sort of as you're heading towards crofton but that connected it to baltimore and it's such a huge deal to me because back in the day you had the little farmer the big farmer pretty much he put his stuff on the railroad and took it out but the little farmer didn't have it so easy and they could then what they called truck farms they could truck their produce up the road it wasn't insanely impossible to drive a rutted muddy uncared for road between point A and B, you would never make it to Baltimore and back. It just couldn't happen. So now after the twenties, especially with the rise of the automobile, the freight train had a little competition, especially for the small guy. And it really jump started the economy, especially the agrarian economy in Southern Maryland. Um, Cause it wasn't just about um, Upper Marlboro. I mean, I'm the center of attention here, but all the five southern counties were linked now with Baltimore through this road. It was a big deal at the time. You mentioned the railroad and the competition. Of course, the railroad put an end basically to using the rivers as a main transportation system. And there's a railroad that goes through Upper Marlboro. Do you have any information on that? Yep, the Baltimore and Potomac. Um, really neat story behind that it, they started it believe it or not in the um i'll show you on this map here folks i know it gets a little busy but over on this side you see a straight line you wonder what that is that's the 301 you see another straight line and this is the railroad um i'm zooming in these are the depot ponds and they're called that because there's a railroad depot used to be right here um, it's the same building, by the way. Let me see if it even comes up. This little database I, I developed. Here we go. That's an O'Brien. Yep. So the Railroad Depot. Um, at any rate, so back in the 1850s, they thought about it and they worked together. He really was a big fanatic on it. And they got enough shares together that by the 1870s they actually had a railroad in place but it was for not only passenger rail uh -huh. as well as freight i'm trying to find it no oh, we have an open mic um oh, here. so baltimore potomac railroad company yes um uh, uh you, you mentioned they do you want me to fill in the they or do you can you expand on who they were uh, if, if you don't mind, I mean, Bowie was a well, big... Well, the, the they are the Bowies. Yeah. Uh, there are many uh, interested parties from Charles County through Prince George's into Anne Arundel. But this, in this county, it is a Bowie-driven project um, to get this railroad in. And once they got the funding together in the 1850s, uh, the, the man who makes it happen as the new president of the company is Odin Bowie, um, a resident sort of of Upper Marlboro, who will become governor after the Civil War. But it, it, the passenger service eventually faded into history. Um, I could talk about another railroad that has that for a little while too, but the freight service still goes on um, despite the recent closing of the coal-fired uh, sections of the power plants that are it used to bring maybe 89, 90 car trains.
and I saw them too. I, I came to town in 2010 and I've seen when you get stuck at that intersection, you get to count freight cars and they were all cold until recently, but now they do some stone and gravel and there's, they're still going. You can hear them in the distance tooting a horn. So there is another rail line or was, you yep. want to talk about that? Sure. So I was just showing him a picture of the 1878 bridge, which still exists, Chew's Bridge. And when they cut through Mr. Chew's farm, they said, look, we're going to build your bridge so you can get from point A to B because it's a pretty hard thing to when you're trying to make a track level to keep it from being on a hill or being in a ditch. And in this case, it was in a ditch. So they built him a bridge. Um, so going back to the Chesapeake Beach Railway. Now, back in the day, I mean, way back in the day, like the late 1800s, there was really no way to get over to Ocean City at the beach. You didn't do that. So the next best thing was getting to the bay. Now, Chesapeake Beach being on the bay, how would you do that when the roads were just horrendous? Um, this was your way to get to the so-called beach or the amusements or the hotels and all the fun stuff. And 1898 to the 1930s, when depression hit, uh, Otto Mears uh, basically, and there's a great book on it, and there's a museum on it I'll talk about in a second, uh, got up the money, funding, and shares to make a small railway to do just that. They took people from Washington, D.C. along various stops, including the town of Upper Marlboro. And I think I can show you a little picture of that. Start rail. get it right chesapeake beach railway timetables 2017 was when i worked on that project and that's right here so give me one second to pull it up and i'll show you the folks while i talk a little more okay Let's see if that looks any good that's the postcard from 1912 the back side of it it's probably not going to be helpful to you but here's the front side of it All right, here's Chesapeake Beach Railway Station back in the day with a horse ground drawn carriage in front of it and some folks standing out front. Notice they're dressed pretty finely in that era. If you can see into the grain, you can tell these folks are dressed to go show, you know, just go have a little fun, right? This guy wears a suit for the beach, it looks like. But at any rate, the beach being Chesapeake Beach, um, it had carousel, uh, one of which, by the way, is sitting over in Watkins Park. It had a hotel, which unfortunately did burn down, um, had little amusements and sort of just like an amusement park type of situation, as well as the so-called beach, which is nothing like, you know, Ocean City Beach, but still it's close, right? And this is how people would go on a weekend and take an excursion. I can give you the fares to, and the timetables and tell you how long it took them to get there. So here it's starting, from, you can go from Chesapeake Beach Railway, Upper Marlboro to Washington. It would be 7.23 a.m. all the way to Washington, which is 8.30. Washington, Upper Marlboro did 8.30 to 9.37. You can see they go back and forth. How long would it take you to get there today? <laughs> um, by road, probably about as long with the traffic. That's that, it, it, interestingly enough, in my particular work, Sometimes it takes us longer, for instance, to get from places in Prince George's to Capitol Hill than it took them 200 years ago. Yeah. Interestingly enough, when you look at these timetables and just a, a footnote, in the early 20th century, very late 19th century, uh, Prince George's County, Washington, D.C., we had a significant what I'll call light rail system. You could go from Laurel to downtown um, D.C. by rail. I believe there was another uh, rail line that came out of Prince George's County to Annapolis. I don't think it lasts too long. Yep. But we to Upper Marlboro, the timetable's up here right now. You could be at Upper Marlboro and hit uh, Laurel. You could go from... Upper Marlboro at 723 and be at Laurel at 911 and be at Annapolis Junction at 918 and be at Baltimore at 10 at Camden. Yeah, we, we um, 
in the in order to get progress, we dug up all the light rail stuff so we could sit in cars um, in traffic jams. And now I guess we're putting the light rail back in. Some things never change, which kind of is the county motto, always the same. Uh, Brian, let, let me move on here. Uh, so we did railroads, roads. We talked about the, the shipping, which was early on, the port, and you mentioned silted in. Do you have yeah. any sort of information? I mean, it, it was a deep water port, right? Back in the early 18th century. Yes, so my ship. wife and I do canoe on the Western Branch and I'll show it to you on this map right here. Um, it's not exactly easy to see until I zoom in, but okay, here's the equestrian center for people who know what that is. And this is route four. And this little curved section is the western branch of the Patuxent River. And back in the day, there was a wide water type of area where they had a wharf where we call Water Street exists, which is um, also next to, there's a Valley Lane and, and there's the church. So the wharf extended from Valley Lane all the way to um, at least to Water Street, maybe even a little further over. And you can tell if you look at the tree lines, I'm not saying that's the original tree line, let's not go crazy, but from the swamp, you can see some flat land, all that siltation from poor farming practices. But to my point, they actually were making lotteries back in late 1700s, early 1800s to try to dredge it and to pull trees out of it. It was just so bad farming wise that they used to farm right up to the edge of the river, which we now just know that's just insane to do because as soon as a good flood comes, you're going to lose a ton of soil and it's going to go in and prevent, you know, basically clog up the... Interestingly, the they also knew. I, I have um, in my library at least one original copy of a 1780 or 1790 farming book. They absolutely knew about erosion and bad farming technique. Uh, and again, the Bowie family wrote monographs in the early 18th century about this is dumb. And <laughs> interestingly enough, um, continuing on my theme of sameness, uh, the, the Water Street, the wharves, the river silts in, and they were trying to raise money to keep the transportation infrastructure intact. Aren't we trying to raise money to make sure Water Street doesn't live up to its name today. Yeah. We're still doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we are um, getting a new bridge built. Yay us. Um, hopefully it will be flood resistant because that is what I'm used to. Live I live in town, so I've been through a few. And let me tell you, the water comes up quick. Try to... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I... I um... You mentioned your house, and I don't know how much time we have left, and I thought maybe you'd tell us a little bit about content and the history of the house, which overlooks, you know, it's kind of overlooks the town in some sense. Right. So I'm on the third floor right now, um, trying to dig through the article to find what I'm looking for. Sometimes it's not quite so easy. This is all fun stuff here. But really, in content, I'm across the street from not directly Trinity Church, which is hallowed land from the 1690s when first it was Presbyterian land and then the Episcopal Church took over. But I'm across from a hall that was built in the 1920s. Before that, I looked directly onto the wharf out of the third story window, should I have lived here back in 1787. And I'm in the exact room where the person who lived here would have done it. Who built the house? Uh, David Crawford did for the Contes. He, and this is a strange story. Didn't you know? I own the house. I still haven't really wrapped my head around it. He built it for his granddaughter, and his granddaughter's name disappeared out of all records very quickly. So it's like she died early, and so then the house sort of passed hand to hand to hand. Um, so Alexander Conti, and then even William Bean's half brother had it for a little while after his house burnt down. But eventually it ended up in Magruder hands and the Magruders had it for the longest period of time in the 1800s. And after that, 
Um, so after Dr. Lee, it was the Magruders, and after the Magruders, it was the uh, Gores, and briefly, and then it was the Bowlings for about half a century. And after that, it was another set of hands until the Smiths, who I bought it from. We we need to back up because a name just flickered by reminding me, William Beans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's one of the most important bits about Upper Marlboro. It, why would I be searching for an article about flooding when I could talk about the War of 1812? Yes. Yeah. In, in I'm not going to go into huge detail, but just to tell you that in 1814, the British came tearing through town pretty much. They they stopped at Pig Point and Patuxent River. They chased uh, Barney and his flotilla all, all up until Barney sculled the flotilla, and they chased everyone came through town with the British hot on their trail. British Inclu including on Colonel Monroe, who they chased off also, as in President Monroe, except he wasn't president then. Yeah, he, he came down your way to, to see what was going on and skedaddled. Yep, they had the spies as they headed towards what we now know as Forestville and on in. You know, Bladensburg was where they finally ended up, but they had sort of scout parties trying to keep an eye on what was going on. The British were marching in extremely hot weather and some of them were dropping like flies. I mean, it would think about hot, humid summers um, in our area. It just you can't imagine wearing a woolen coat and carrying all the gear and just marching yourself to death or at least heat stroke. But it, either way, um, so General Ross was put up at, at the Beads resident, you know, not necessarily treated badly, perhaps. But what are you going to do when your um, William Beans in your town has been invaded? So then where was where do we think uh, where was William Beans house? Academy Hill. So where the old Marlboro Elementary School sits, thankfully still, um, there's a hill just across from the post office in town and it has a school on it. Well, that's Academy Hill. And they had an idea for an academy there since the 1700s, back when Mr. Beans lived there. Um, it took it. He was long dead before they actually, you know, in 1835, they took care of it and actually made an academy there. But William Beans had his residence there and it was used as the first academy. OK, but, but he 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 has some other important stuff. That involves him. Well, so yeah. so General yeah. Ross has dinner with him. General Ross goes and does urban renewal in Washington, D.C., General Ross leaves Washington burning and comes back. Do you want to take the story from there? He's on his way back to his sure. ships. Um, so as they were leaving our town to push it along a little further, some of the British soldiers were collecting, you know, stuff as, you know, the, the not necessarily spoils of war. Who knows? Maybe they wanted the liquor. Maybe they wanted whatever, but they were supposedly robbing the town as the victor typically would do and um because they were stragglers in other words they the vast majority of the war party or however you call it was marched out of town william beans and, and a couple of his uh buddies they captured him and, and took him and put him in jail strangely enough they, they put him in the queen anne jail which is to the north towards annapolis and presumably for the reason, I know Ralph Eshelman's probably about to kick me in the back of the head, but presumably the reason to, you know, sort of subterfuge, maybe to keep them far enough away that if someone did come back and say, hey, we don't know what's going on. But um, British are smart and they know what's going on and they did notice the British soldiers missing and they did come back for them. And that's where the story gets interesting. They capture Mr. Bean's and say, look, we're going to hold you until we get our prisoners back or thereof, or basically we're going to capture you. They took him out on a ship. Um, it happened to be one of the ships that they had to take with them up to Baltimore. And as they're trying to bombard Fort McHenry, we all know that. The, oh, wait, yeah, you know. but before you give it away, isn't he, uh, isn't um, William Beans connected by marriage to a lawyer? Yeah, uh, Francis Scott. Yes, who also is on the ship to conduct a parole, right? 
Yeah. I, I don't want to step on your story. No, no, so you... now they go up to Baltimore. Right, right. So um, they're, they're basically, if the British do end up letting him go, they're certainly not going to do it while he's in that position and they're in that position something's got to happen first which is the british are gonna try to capture or at least do some major damage to baltimore which has been a thorn in their side for quite some time um so the story goes uh by the dawn's early light da 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 so you you know that out there watching the bombardment all night not knowing for certain whether it would be successful um played into the Star Spangled Banner being written. And of course, oh, I lost my little window. Star Spangled Banner being written. And from there, the um, important bit was they did actually release him, but only after failing to capture the fort and or, and or destroy the fort. So, um, so um, uh, William Bean's house is no longer there. There's a school um, derelict there. Is there anything else on Academy Hill? Uh, there's a principal's rest uh, residence. Well, we which, won't talk about that we're either. We won't talk about that. But there's a Bean's grave, that's for sure. That's and right. In very recent era, I've got a 1940 image of that, uh, thanks to a Mr. Lee Rector, who I've been hanging out with a bit. And I think I can share something like this. If you don't mind me grabbing the share screen again, sorry to do that to you folks. Okay, hopefully you can see this. This is Bean's grave as it looked in 1940. Can it, if anyone can see that, you can see there's two people buried here and that's Bean's and his wife, uh, Hanson. Um, so, the Hanson family, so she was a Hanson, and that has some other history you can go into as far as before George Washington, sort of extra credit, who was uh, before there was a United States of America officially. You mean the real first president of these United States. Yeah, thank you for helping with my family of words. But in other words, so his wife was that relation. Look at the tree growing up through that. This, these are up there now. You can go look at them. They're on the War of 1812 um, tour so that there's a, a placard at the bottom of the hill which helps you to find where to go to, to look at it because it kind of is well hidden on top of that hill. But if you see the big school across from the post office, you're in the right place. Um, I want to um, uh, first ask our facilitator, how many minutes do I have? Five. Okay. Um, the Upper Marlboro is becomes the county seat, I think, in the seventeen twenty early seventeen twenties. Um, the county seat, meaning where the court is, and where the court is would have been the jail, and next to the jail, from time to time, there would have been um, executions. You have any information on, uh, you know, hangings and sort of where the old jail was? Yes, um, some very sad bits of history, actually. In 1956-ish, I think, there was a uh, group who was working on the jail, and they happened to dig up some bones. So um, let's go see where that is. Okay, here it is, 1940 jail in 2022, 0723. And that's this. Here's the courthouse. Let me go find the jail real quick for you guys. There it is. Okay, so this is the 30s era jail, um, or actually 20, after 27. So this would have been around 1940. And this is what it looked like. Believe it or not, it stood till the 60s. But during this time, unfortunately, they realized that when there were hangings and no one collected the bodies, they would actually have them buried in the back. And it wasn't really a big deal until they were doing some work on it and the workers dug up the bodies and actually Mr. Sasser, Dr. Sasser had to come by and say, hey, 
Um, these are actually what they used to do when they couldn't find a, a relative to give the body to. They just put them right here. The downside of that is they said they moved them and marked it, but I have no record of that. Well, that's that's interesting. Um, hmm. I have so, no idea where they moved them and marked them. And it was some, some more research. Operated. I yep. think there's a, there's a research uh, opportunity there. Absolutely, there always is. In in our closing minutes before we get thousands of questions, is there anything that I haven't brought up that you want to share? Um, a little bit. Now, the town has an interest not only in tobacco, I could talk for hours on that, but horse racing. We know the county fair was held here for many, many years, 1842, I think. And the horse racing was actually started now, Annapolis had the first sets of horse racing, but they've been horse racing in Upper Marlboro since the 1750s. That was a very colonial thing. The strange thing about that, as soon as we had a Revolutionary War, sort of did not become a thing because we didn't want to do what England did. And then it came back and then it went away. And then in the Civil War era, all the horses disappeared because they became part of the Confederate cavalry. And then after a ways, sort of the late 1800s, it came back again until it sort of died down in, I guess, 70s, 80s. And then, of course, the uh, race uh, race course uh, bandstand did burn down. They fought the clubhouse, and they finally just scrapped it all together. We don't do horse racing anymore, folks. And if you go to the equestrian center, you can find, if you walk around the track, that there's a big chunk of it missing because of the Marlboro floods. And it, it would take a whole lot to put it back together again for sure but they do a ton of cool horse events down there um it's just mostly in the new rings that they've set up and they're not racing them if we were talking horse racing um we would be talking prince george's and and places like bel-air and governor ogle bringing the first thoroughbreds in and i think in the 1730s um yeah. but yes upper marlboro horse racing tobacco, county seat, transportation, railroads, operas. We've got everything. Yeah, I, isn't I like isn't that the a... motto for Upper Marlboro? We've got everything? Well, it, it, I actually think about it in terms of, you've heard Maryland being the microcosm of the United States. It's got the mountains, the rivers, the lakes, the whatever. Now, we're the microcosm, I think, of Maryland, or at least maybe in my mind we are, because we've got all sorts of things. If you go up on the high hills on Route 202 and look down, you can see we've got a pretty steep grade. And so we've got a valley and a little, not mountain, mountain, but we've got the river and I canoe on that river. And we've got pond, which is a great resource. We've just got all these little things all put together in one spot. Kind of neat. Well, I call it home. Well, Brian, I think I've used the five minutes up and, and it's always a delight for me to talk with you. And as you know, I am I need people like you who do the hard work of collecting the information so I can spin stories. Um, without the work that you do, it would make it impossible for me to stand up and improvise and, and cast a wide net of a narration of the history of the area of the county and of Maryland. So I wanna thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of Upper Marlboro and for people like me that need this research and need somebody who collects this information and puts it where we can find it in one place. Well, thank you. And, and likewise, um, you've probably told from the story that I'm not the usual historian who gets on here. I'm not really a historian at all. Um, I like to help historians, though, and I gladly lend assistance to anyone who has questions about that sort of thing um, that I could help research with. I've been working with the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. I've worked with the Civil Rights Trail recently with uh, Megan Bacon um, of the Anacostia Girls Heritage. Uh, just anything that I can do to help in that falls within my abilities to do newspaper research or whatever, I'd gladly do so. 
Well, um, Madam Facilitator, do, do we have some questions? We do have at least one at the moment. Um, so Lynn Roberts asked, on top of the brick piers of Dr. Williams B. Bean's gravesite, it looks like as if they are um, mounted by um, iron cannonballs. Are those still there? Are the, And are they actual cannonballs, if they are? Do not know if they're actual cannonballs. I have touched them, but who knows if someone made them later and made them look like that. I, I wouldn't imagine that they're real cannonballs, though. That that would, I don't know. Good question, though. Maybe mm -hmm. another research project. Um, and then Ralph Eshman said, good job, Ryan. Oh, thank you, Ralph. I do appreciate it. Once again, I'm not a great historian, folks. You probably can figure that out, but I sure love doing this sort of thing. And if there well, is, ever for, is anything you need. Brian, I, for our audience, that. we we don't usually have quote unquote historians. We have people from the county who have an interest in history, culture, or the heritage of the county, each with a story to tell. So these are not a collection of serious historians, but chats about history and about the culture and about the heritage of Prince George's and you're doing great. Well, thank you. We need thank you. you. <laughs> Any Is other it... questions out there? Not at the, oh, hold on. Uh, let's see. Catherine Lawson made a comment. I am not familiar with the area at all. Would my ancestors who were married in 1783 in St. John's or Piscataway Parish be associated with Upper Marlboro? It seems these two areas are too far apart, but I had seen a brief note regarding them being in Upper Marlboro. They certainly would have been able to travel to Upper Marlboro um, back in the day. Now, the parish has been there as long as we've been here. So certainly, I mean, it was at the same time frame and the roads did lead through here to Annapolis. So, I, I might be able to comment. Um, you are you are correct, Brian. I know of some of the people of the Piscataway area and St. John's in Broad Creek, whose idea of an evening out was to come to Upper Marlboro. Upper Marlboro was the place to go when he, the 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 married couple wanted to escape. I assume from the children. <laughs> And um, I'm thinking of John Henry Bain coming to Upper Marlboro many times um, for an evening out for parties. Upper Marlboro is where people gathered not only for business, but there were, um, what do we call it? Not a club, a country club is what we call it today. There, there were hotels, actual hotels in Upper Marlboro. This was the place that you came and it also was a stop for people in Virginia who were on their way to say Annapolis or points north. Upper Marlboro was the place to stop over and, and stay in a hotel, to stay uh, with friends in the area. So yeah, it was the place and certainly somebody from St. John's in Piscataway would have been familiar if they had the resources and wherewithal they could easily have gotten to Upper Marlboro on a regular basis. Okay. Um, Lynn Roberts has another question. Why did no one try to save and preserve the old jail? Do you know what the story is there? Well, I don't know which old, old jail we're talking about. There's a couple. Yes. Um, the one in 20, 1927 was just too small and insecure. People kept getting out of it. That doesn't make it much of a jail. So they tore it down and there was a uh, article in 1927 where a uh, name g sasser hmm, sasser of upper marlboro talked about getting a bill for bond for forty thousand dollars to rebuild the jail but then again you're probably talking about the jail after that um they built another jail that was even more secure that's the 70s jail that still exists by the way it's got a um a kids a county administration support for uh kids in the basement and probably storage in the top. It's over by the courthouse, big parking garage. Also, the, the problem of jails, when we go back to colonial, 
there's a colonial sheriff in Upper Marlboro who is uh, quite the, I don't know what to call him, Sheriff Lee, um, who was notorious. In, in those days, the sheriffs didn't have a budget, so they had to maintain the jail at their own expense and then charge the prisoners. Or if it was a court order to hold somebody, then they had to build the General Assembly. And General, uh, General Lee, the uh, Sheriff Lee was real big on trying to get his money any way he could. And the jail, I believe, was sort of no roof sometimes. There's actually a General um, Assembly investigation of his jail in Upper Marlboro, and he's kind of told to leave the county. So he goes and sets one up in Charles County, which is even worse than the one he ran in Upper Marlboro. So we've had, as Brian said, a number of jails over 320 years, 310 years. And, and one of them in 1849 was burnt down by an escaped inmate, got back at him a little. Okay, um, yep. Adam Cantor is asking um, if PG Atlas is available for public use. And the answer to that is yes, but Brian, do you know what the website is for it? Sure, let me see if I can share one more time. I know I'm really heavy on this today. And hopefully you can see here's pgatlas.com. And the quick way about it is where's Upper Marlboro? It's right here, I'll zoom in. I know we probably have two minutes left and you can zoom in and see all the streets. So you do not have to have a login. They ask for it, but it's not entirely necessary. This is the town. And if you go to here, I'm gonna show you one quick thing. Uncheck the property, go to supplemental imagery and go all the way down and you can see how it looked in 1965. So you can also see how it looked in 1930 something and 30. you can do a historic sites overlay. Yep, 38. That's what it looked like. So just as a hint, that's the first starting point for your um, checking out of PG Atlas. It's a wonderful resource. I wish every county was as smart as PG County or Prince George's County for having it. Okay. So in order to see the chat, I need to unshare you. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, whoops. Um, so Catherine Wathen, who had the question about the Piscataway and St. John's parishes, said thank you. Um, okay, that seems to be it. John Peter, did you have anything else? Uh, no, no, no. I'm I'm uh, happy that I was actually able to log on um, to tonight's chat. So I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, so Adam can I believe it's Adam Cantor. Yes, Adam Cantor came back. How can we access the old pictures you've shared with us? Good question. So almost all of them are on the Town of Upper Marlboro Historical Committee Facebook page, along with the associated stories. So just look that up. You'll get lost. It, it, it'll take you a year and change to read through it all. Hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, just send them our way. Okay. Don, Donna, we might put a plug in for if they're really hooked by Brian, the Historical Society Library. Take it away, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about our own uh, photo digitization project. Well, I'm so. talking about our archival li library with 8,000 books on county and area history and all of our larger picture collection um, that we have for the public also, most of which you need to come to us in Greenbelt some of which you will be able to see online shortly. Well, John Peter just gave a good summation of what the Frederick DeMar Library has. We have a six to 7,000 books somewhere in there. Um, thousands of photographs, which we are just starting to digitize and catalog and archive. Um, we're, we're also looking for volunteers to help us do that project. Um, we have, um, um, not only photographs, we have slides and negatives. We have to get, we have to digitize as well. Um, we have maps. We have um, articles, um, all kinds of 
information we've collected over the last 50 years about the county um, and the surrounding area and state of Maryland. So feel free to drop by any Saturday from 11 to 3 at the Greenbelt, we're at the basement of the Greenbelt Public Library. Of course, send us a question to, uh, on our email site. We'll see if we can answer it. Right. Our email is info at pghistory.org if you have any history-related questions that we can help you with. So um, let's see. There's one more chat comment. Um, Terry Windsor said, thank you. Found it very interesting. So thank you. So um, thank you, John Peter and Brian for your um, chat this evening and to everybody who joined us, um, thank you for doing so. Um, the Society, as I sort of alluded to, is a, an all volunteer organization. And if you enjoy these history chats, please consider becoming a member or making a donation to us. That'll help us make sure these history chats can remain free. Um, our next history chat will be on Monday, April 24th for a chat about archeology. span um, and April is Archaeology Month in, in um, the state of Maryland, so that'll be timely. Um, we hope you can join us for that chat, and we have chats on the fourth Monday of the month um, up through October. So I hope you can join us for a future one, another future one as well. So um, if there's nothing further, I want to say good night. Uh, thank you for Donna. Joining. The chats yes. are recorded and on our website, also yes, free. Are. Yes. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a nice evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brian. Yep, had a great time.